All right, students, welcome. In this video, we're going to take a look at the main concepts of assignment 7.3, oceans. We'll start with ocean geology. The world is one ocean, really. They're all connected. And it involves a study of physics, chemistry, geology, and biology. Uh, we should know that oceans cover 71% of the Earth's surface and that they contain 97.2% of the planet's surface water. And surprisingly, only a few percent of it have actually been explored. We actually know more about Mars geography than we do the ocean geography. The composition of ocean water is as such. We have 96.5% um, of it is water. 3% is sodium and chloride ions, which is table salt. And 0.5% is other salts. When we take a look at the temperature, as we go deeper, it gets colder. Water temperatures drop steeply in the first 1,000 meters of ocean water, and tropical waters are warmer at the surface but show the steepest drop. You can see tropical regions here, but they drop very sharply. And once we go to about 1,000 meters, it's all the same temperature. So, quiz them for you. In the northern hemisphere, ocean currents generally flow which way? Go ahead and pause. All right, welcome back. I hope that you picked C, clockwise, as your answer choice. And what is the name for this effect? Well, let's take a look at this diagram here. It's called the Coriolis effect. And you'll see that along the equator, the equator is not shown in here, but it goes right along the middle. Um, along that, all ocean currents are generally going from the east to the west. And so that creates these kind of circulation patterns that has to go that has to go counterclockwise um, I'm sorry clockwise in the north and counterclockwise in the south for consistent for consistency um, we'll talk about this a little bit more in class too but let me just um, point out one thing to you if you it's related to the spin of the earth and if the earth were to suddenly stop and start rotating the other way then these directions would all change um, so they would flip and um, yeah, we, we see the same direction for the currents when we talk about air currents in our future unit. So ocean currents are vast river-like flows in the surface waters of the ocean. And they're driven by density differences, sunlight, and also wind. They can be cool or warm, they vary in size and speed, and they definitely influence climate. And one thing that we can see with that is the El Nino effect that we'll talk about in a moment. So, quiz them for you. In the deep ocean, the water generally has. Go ahead and pause and pick your choice. All right. Did you pick low temperature, high salinity? That is the correct answer. We can see that cold, salty, deep water is deep, and um, warm, uh, less salty water is closer to the surface. So basically, the idea is when water is colder, the molecules are moving slower, so they're closer together, making the water more dense. And with salt, the more that's dissolved, the saltier it is and the denser it is. <clears throat> Another quiz for you. When upwelling occurs, which of the following are brought to the surface? Multiple mark. So, pause. Welcome back. I hope you recognize that the only two answers that are correct are phosphates and nitrates. What's the deal with that? Well, first of all, warm water is already at the surface, so that's not going to be the answer. And oxygen is actually always greatest at the top, because that's where photosynthesis is happening with the algae. And the sunlight can only go so deep into the water, so it's really only the top layer of the ocean that has a lot of photoactivity happening. And then as far as phytoplankton goes, they're the ones doing the photosynthesis, so they're also only at the top. We can see this diagram showing upwelling. And um, the waters down here at the bottom are very nutrient-rich. Oxygen-poor, but nutrient-rich and cold. But under certain wind patterns, the water that's at the surface gets pushed away from the coast. And that causes water from the bottom to come up and take its place. And so that's really, really important because it's bringing nutrients up to where the algae need it. 
and um, and the fish depend on those algae. So it really is essential for life. And um, let's see here. Let's go to the next slide here as we talk about vertical movement of ocean water. A little bit more about that. Ocean water can move up or down due to wind, heating, or density differences. So we just talked about upwelling, as we see right here. And um, it can also occur when two currents come together, diverge. Naturally, one current is going to go underneath the other, depending on salinity and temperature. And so that can be another case where, um, <clears throat> where lower water gets pushed up. And this is... Um, yeah, just one final thought about the upwelling part. It's really important for fisheries, okay? Because they, in order to have healthy fish, they need to have enough plankton to eat, and the plankton need those nutrients. There is something called downwelling, which is when warm surface water moves downward, and um, it occurs where currents converge. I may have spoke mistakenly back there when, about oceans where currents diverge. If you have two currents separating, what's going to take the place from in between them is new water coming up from below. Where you have two currents converging, they're coming together, and so one of them is going to get um, pushed down, and that's called downwelling. And it can bring dissolved oxygen to deep water life, where it's really, it's really important because if you think about it, all those creatures that are down where it's dark in the deep sea, they are either doing chemo-autotroph with those hydrogen vents, sulfide vents, or they're consumers. And if they're consumers, they need to have oxygen, just like we do. So how does the oxygen get to them? There's nobody doing photosynthesis down there. That oxygen has to come from up above. A little review of the topography of the seafloor. Um, we have that mid-Atlantic Ocean Ridge running right down the bottom. So these two plates are moving away from each other. And we can also see in this picture the continental shelf. So um, this is where it's relatively shallow. Uh, as you go not too far offshore, but then you get, um, then you fall below, <clears throat> you you come off of that shelf and it gets much deeper, and that's what we refer to as the real deep ocean. Here's a little stylized diagram there, and we see the continental shelf along here, and this is important because this is the area where depths are shallow and a lot of biological activity occurs right along here. Um, here's an example of the ocean ridge. Here's a, an example of an ocean trench. And we get these trenches when we have one plate going underneath another plate. And, um, and that's also, that often forms volcanoes. All right, going to the next part here. El Nino. Let's see, is this little video going to play? Let's give it a shot. Saturday Night Live, late 90s. Uh, All right, Chris Farley. So the official name for El Nino is ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. And what that oscillation refers to is that about every seven to nine years, there is a shift in the way that the major trade winds uh, blow. So trade winds, they're just a name for the winds that blow um, a little bit south of the equator. They usually blow from uh, east to west. In fact, if you look at the height of the water, around Indonesia. It's actually a couple of feet higher than it is in, um, along the coast of South America just because of the water getting pushed over by the wind. And as we learned about upwelling, which is why we're talking about this now, is that when the wind blows, it is then uh, bringing up that nutrient-rich water. So it's essential for all the farmers that are along the South American coast here, especially off of Chile and Peru, super important for them. However, Every seven years or so, the pattern changes. So this is a normal year, and um, okay, so I said seven to nine, I guess it's more like three to seven years. Under normal conditions, okay, we already mentioned about that. So let's take a look at an El Nino year. Under El Nino conditions, the winds change and upwelling does not occur. The coastal waters of South America remain warm, causing increased evaporation 
and precipitation that affects the entire western coast all the way up to North America. These are years of intense winter storms for California and mild winters for the eastern U.S. So let's kind of review that there. Um, because you don't, because these trade winds stop or drop, you basically have this warm water hanging around. Because normally it get pushed over towards Indonesia, and as it sits around, because it's warm, it causes greater evaporation, which also results in greater precipitation. And so um, there's another. So we we see, you know, we've had some pretty bad El Nino years. For me, the one that sticks out in my mind is 1998 eight when um, I was living in LA at the time and man we got tons and tons of rain and then in 2003 I think we had another El Nino year we had two storms come together at the same time up here in the mountains we got over 20 inches of rain in two days and it caused landslides and it was just gnarly that's when 154 blew out and there was a huge landslide on on old San Marcos Road. So for me to get to school those days, I had to go all the way through Buellton. Took me an hour and 15 minutes. Here's another diagram of El Nino, just showing the same same concept, but just a little different. Here we see that upwelling being, um, you know, being shown. And um, again, when during an El Nino year, it's really bad for these farm for the fish fishermen around here because those fish dwindle because they're not getting the nutrients that they need from the, um, from the deep waters. Or more technically, the phytoplankton they eat are not getting those nutrients. All right, um, so how do we predict El Nino? Well, basically we look at surface temperature measured by a bunch of buoys out there in the Pacific Ocean. And, uh, and we look at you know various patterns, but that's a big one, a big part of it. All right. So marine ecosystems, um, let's pause here and we'll pick up in part two.